but we're very pleased to have Olivia with us tonight. She was recommended highly by one of our board members, Terry Rylander, who has seen her speak previously. And Olivia lives in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is a beautiful place. And I was just there a couple of weeks ago and we have been having a lovely conversation for the last couple of minutes, kind of getting to know one another. And I would like to thank her so much for coming as well as all of you for joining us this evening. And if I don't believe I have anything else, um, we do do this speaker series on every third Wednesday of the month. So please join us next Wednesday or next month, August, um, on the third Wednesday. And we will be listening to Kurt Dozer from the, um, I think, the Water District, the um, Southern Nevada Water Authority. And he will be speaking about um, water in our Southern Nevada area. So with that, I am going to go ahead and turn it over to Olivia and let her share her screen with you. Thank you so much, Brenda. I'm excited to be here and to have a chance to talk with you all. Let me share screen here. <clears throat> Let's see, can y'all see that okay? Thumbs up from someone, okay. All right, good. Uh, so yeah, my name's Olivia Carroll. I study native solitary bees and I'll explain what those are in just a minute. Um, I've been doing this for, oh, a little over 25 years now. <laughs> I used to do it by myself. It was just me out, but now I do it with the next generation of bee collectors, my daughters. Uh, and they happen to be fellow lovers of the natural world. So that makes it a little bit easier. They used to come along kind of reluctantly. They didn't necessarily want to be there, maybe just for the snacks, but they've become avid lovers of the outdoor world. And we usually have a pretty good time together. I made the mistake two summers ago <laughs> of telling them I'd pay them $5 a bee to collect with me. And in the first hour I was out $75 and I had to cut them off. So um, I learned a little lesson there. Who knew a six-year-old had the skills to make more per hour than I do? <laughs> I'll have to adjust my price point moving forward. Uh, in addition to the wonderful time I get to spend outdoors with my kiddos, which I really love. Uh, I'm going to admit some people that are showing up on my screen here. Um, and I kind of get to wander through the woods and look at flowers all day. I love the work that I do because for me, it's a constant and important reminder that bees represent and show us the tangible manifestation of how organisms interact uh, with their ecosystems. Things from completely different branches on the tree of life uh, working together towards their own separate goals. And this to me is really exciting. You know, I went to school. I have a I got my bachelor's degree from Utah State University. I got a master's degree also studying bees from Utah State. And during my time getting these degrees and then onto Southern Illinois for a PhD, you end up in classrooms where they talk about these amazing ecological concepts that are so beautiful. And they make these beautiful graphs and you know bell-shaped curves and all of these models and things. But it's all rather abstract in the classroom. And I really love that the job that I have shows me exactly what we talk about in the classroom kind of come to life. And I'll show you a little bit of that tonight. So hopefully you can be as excited about it as I am. Um, I wanna start by making sure that you understand what it is that we're talking about. Um, most people, when they think of bees, think of this lovely creature. This is a honeybee, of course. Um, but I think the honeybees are kind of more like the black sheep of the bee world. They don't really represent well most of the bees that we find in North America. And so I want to walk you through, first of all, some of the things we know about honeybees and then compare that to the solitary bees that I'll be focusing on. I like to think of them as wild bees. So this is the honeybee. There is one species of honeybee in North America. There's seven-ish around the world. Uh, the one species here is Apis mellifera, and it's an amazing creature. It's highly social, meaning that within any hive, there's usually, <clears throat> oh, I don't know, a couple of thousand to several thousand individuals sort of all living together and dividing up all of the tasks that need to be done in order to maintain the hive. They divide up the task of even creating offspring with the queen in there who does all of the egg laying and then worker bees that take care of her and take care of the offspring and take care of the nest and go and gather pollen and nectar and all of those things. And what's really neat about this is it's a perennial colony. So they last for many, many years. The queen can live for five, maybe even seven years 
And during that whole time, in order to make sure that everyone can be fed in the winter when there's no flowers out, because they're perennial as adults, because they overwinter as adults, they make honey. Honey is like canned flowers, the same way we can tomatoes or peaches or cherries, whatever it is you can, in order to have those things available in the winter when fruit's not out. Um, bees sort of do the thing, same thing, and that's why they make honey. And we take advantage of this and the fact that they live in these hives that we can pick up and move from place to place to help us with pollination, and we semi-domesticated them. There's some online who will debate about whether they're truly domesticated or not. I'm just going to call them semi-domesticated. And they're not native to North America. Apis mellifera, the species that we have sort of domesticated and, and live with and work with so much, is not um, native to North America was brought over a couple different times, roughly four or 500 years ago, um, either with Europeans that settled in Northeastern North America or um, through Mexico and up into North America. Um, so bees, as, as these honeybees, as great as they are, all of those things, I think that a good way to think of them is the same way that we think about chickens. So in the same way that we have these domestic animals that we really, work well with and we use the products from them and they they descend from some sort of wild animal but they're not really wild animals anymore that's how you should think about the honeybee compared to what i want to talk about tonight which is more like wild bees so in the same way that a chicken is equivalent to a honeybee you can think of a wild bee as equivalent to a hummingbird or an eagle or a finch or something like that so I want to walk you through some of the characteristics of these solitary, these wild bees that I'm going to talk about, just to sort of contrast them with the honeybee and what we know about them. The first thing I want to tell you is that bees can come in many sizes. So while the honeybee, many often think that all bees come in the, just the size that is honeybee size. That's how big bees are. Um, they actually can come in sizes, and this is to scale up to a quarter. This is a carpenter bee, one of the Western species. You have these in Nevada where you guys probably, I'm guessing many of you are, um, all the way down to something closer to the width of a quarter. These are fairy bees or perdida, really small. The smallest bee <clears throat> in North America actually occurs throughout the Southwest, New Mexico, Arizona, California, maybe just barely into Nevada. Um, and it's this big, it's Perdida minima, this minute fairy bee here. And that's actually it right next to the quarter. So that's true to scale, just to give you a sense. So bees come in many sizes. Um, and it, unlike the honeybee, which mostly nests in these hives, most of them are boxes that we've made for them and something like that. Maybe there's a wild one that lives in a, a cavity or a cave somewhere, but mostly, mostly in hives that we've created for them. Uh, most bees nest in the ground. About 70% of bees in North America can be found nesting in some variation of a hole in the ground. Um, not too dissimilar from sort of what you would see for an ant mound or where a wasp is nesting or something like that. Um, they, they don't all look the same. There's so many species of wild bees. You can imagine that all of them have different ideas of what a nest in the ground should look like. Um, some of them will nest in little holes in the ground that have a turret sort of rising above them. Some of them, it's literally just a hole. And if you didn't see the bee go into that hole, you wouldn't know it was there. Or see some debris, maybe a little pollen around the edges. Some of them will have a sort of an ant mound with the entrance at the top or maybe at the side sort of burrowing in. Some of them will nest in sand dunes where they land on the surface of the sand and vibrate their bodies down until they get deep enough in the sand that they can find a burrow and burrow in. Um, so all sorts of variations on that theme, but a good majority of them can be found nesting in the ground. If you look inside one of these, if you look at bee nests in the ground, you usually find um, sort of this long main shaft, this main tunnel coming down. And then off the end of that, in all sorts of different varieties, you'll find a series of little tiny chambers, little tiny chambers. And in each one of those, a female bee, a wild bee, will leave um, a ball of pollen and she'll lay an egg on top of that and then backfill this. And when that egg hatches, the little larva there eats the pollen that the mother left for it. That bee will never meet its mother. This is different than honeybees where because they last so long, they often meet not only their mother, but all of their sisters. <clears throat> uh, wild bees 
most of the time don't meet their mother, but they eat that pollen and grow up and develop into a new bee that will dig its way back out of that nest chamber and emerge probably most likely the following year and start the cycle over again. Most of these bee nests, from what we can find by doing studies where we blow, as you can see over here on the left, some chalk dust down into a hole and then sort of follow the, the little white lines that it makes. Most of these bees nest anywhere from a couple inches to maybe a foot or two under the ground, but there are some really interesting cases where these bees will nest super deep in the ground. Um, this is one in South Central Utah. My mentor actually dug this one up in a place called the San Rafael Swell. And it was an interesting, it's not a rare bee or anything, but it was an interesting case where there was a whole bunch of area where it seemed like the bees could be nesting, but they were only nesting in one place. So to figure out why, you know, they blew the chalk dust in, dug down, et cetera, et cetera, and finally found the bottom of that nest nine feet underground for a bee that's about a third of an inch in size. And the thought is that probably what's happening there is the successive generations of bees are using the same main tunnel, but then digging a little bit deeper and making their own sort of chambers off to the sides of that. So again, with the lots of variation with these guys. Uh, the bees that don't nest in the ground usually nest in wood. Here's an example. This is a leaf cutter bee. She got a little, little tiny rolled up piece of leaf that she's cut off of something, maybe a rose or a lilac or all sorts of different kinds of plants um, that are often used. And she's carrying it back to a hole in a piece of wood and she'll use it to sort of line the walls inside and make little tiny chambers to hold her offspring. Again, lots of variation with this, just with everything with these. Some of them, rather than use it as a sort of an envelope, will chew up the leafy material instead and use it to create partitions between different nest cells. So this is a mason bee. She's got pollen on her belly that she's scraping off to create these sort of walls of pollen and in front of each, so on the left side, she'll lay an egg. So you can see that she's already built a chamber for one, two, three, four, and she's working on her fifth little offspring. And each of them is divided with this um, chewed up leaf material as a wall. So each, each little offspring is still separate from all of the others. Um, <clears throat> and what she'll do is, so when you think about this, you know, if she's starting at the, say the left end and building all the way in, she started with that one most, almost all the way to the right, which means that egg is kind of the oldest. It's been there the longest and is probably going to hatch the first. And if it hatches first and is ready to emerge from the nest, there's really no way out except to go through all of the offspring in the front, all of its younger siblings that are before it. So to prevent complete catastrophe when that, that oldest bee gets impatient and wants out, um, female bees do this really cool thing where at the time that they lay an egg, they can pick whether that egg is gonna develop into a male or a female bee. So female bees are the result of fertilization. So sperm and egg come together as they leave her body and that creates an egg that, that becomes a female. Unfertilized egg, so an egg with no sperm added to it becomes a male. So she lays the females at the back of the nest and the males at the front because the females take a little longer and that way hopefully everyone will be ready to emerge more or less at the same time, try and prevent any major problems. Uh, here's another example. So this is the actual little pieces of leaf that are rolled up to make those envelopes that I was talking about, just so you can see all of the different ways. Some bees will nest in sandstone. Here's a really cool one that occurs in the desert southwest a lot and uses its mandibles to sort of chew into wood. Other things that happen inside bee nests, um, it might not always be leaf material. Sometimes they'll shave cotton off of plants. Here's a little wool carter bee shaving off a little cotton ball. You can see it underneath her jaws there. You could hear her maybe. Uh, and she'll take that back and use it to pad the inside of her nest. So in case you didn't get a look, you can see here underneath her body, there's a ball of cotton that she'll use inside the nest for nest construction. Lots of variations. Some of them will use plant petals. Some bees actually can sort of exude a material that dries hard, sort of like um, like a cellophane or Ziploc bag sort of stuff. So it's waterproof and they use that to line the inside of the nest and keep the babies dry um, and free from bacteria inside the nest. And some bees nest in snail shells, also really cool. 
<clears throat> male bees don't have nests. So grown up adult male bees don't have a nest. You'll often find them in aggregations at night. They'll sort of clump together. They fight for territory all day long, but at night come together in these bachelor pads, if you will, and hang out. They don't all um, group together. Um, I have in my yard a plant called globe mallow. The genus is Sprousia, and there's a lot of bees that will nest or, or sleep. The male bees will sleep inside those flowers that close up at night, which can be really fun to go find right about sundown. So to walk you through the life cycle of one of these guys here, um, I could do this. I could have started this as a summer bee. I could have made it a fall bee. I picked a spring one. Um, they're all, all possible. Uh, in the same way that like you know, we have a season when cherries are ripe and a season when watermelons are ripe and, you know, squash season and all of these things. In the same way that our fruits ripen at certain times, there are bees that fly uh, seasonally. And at different times of the year, you'll find different bee groups flying. So in the early spring, there's a group called mining bees, really beautiful, really large and very diverse group. Um, and they come out in the early spring. So we're, we're going to just walk through the life cycle for one of these. So that when the bees emerge, usually the males come out first. Like I mentioned earlier, usually males are, are ready and developed a little bit earlier than the female. As soon as they're out, they'll start flying around crazily, trying to find females as fast as they can, maybe digging down into the earth where they think she might be emerging before she's even popped up. They'll mate with her and she'll store that sperm inside her body until she's ready to lay eggs and use it to determine, you know, male, female bees. Uh, by spring, the females are all out and foraging and building nests uh, as fast as they can, as many eggs as they can provide for, um, the more fit they are. So they, they work hard and fast, busy as a bee is definitely a real thing. Because by summer, you know, six to nine weeks later, the adults that you see flying around during that season are dead, they're gone. All that's left is the offspring that will develop in the nests underground. Think about how many bees are in the ground under your feet all year long developing into the next generation of bees. And then they'll overwinter as almost adults. And when the temperature of the soil, the, temper, the, the, the humidity of the soil and everything is just right, they'll emerge the following year and start the cycle over again. Uh, this is a little different than the honeybee, so I thought it worth pointing out. Uh, many of these bees are specialists. So even when there's a wide array of flowering plants in bloom that they could collect pollen from to feed to their offspring, they limit themselves to some subset, some small group of plants, usually things in the same genus, maybe in the same family, maybe the sunflower genus Helianthus, or maybe the sunflower family Asteraceae. And that's what they feed to their offspring. They'll visit other plants when gathering nectar, but when it comes to feeding their babies, they give them only certain kinds of food. And this relationship holds up across generations. So they always visit the same plants from generation to generation and throughout their range. So bees found in New Mexico that are one species will specialize on the same plants if found also in Nevada. So to help you understand this, um, maybe you guys know Cheers. Uh, you can think of, of these guys over here as our specialists and generalists are the ones that sort of do a little more bar hopping all over the place. Uh, worldwide, there's somewhere between 20 and 30,000 bee species. We're discovering new species all the time. So this number is changing as we learn more and name more species and work on that. We think there's somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 in the US and Canada combined. Mexico adds a whole lot more bees. They've got a lot of really neat stuff down there. And in Nevada, we're right around 1,000 that have been identified and named so far. So for comparison, if we look at all bee species that occur east of the Mississippi River in all of those states combined, we're looking at around 770 bee species. Um, east of the Mississippi River. And if we look, if we break this down by state and take a look, you can see that most of our states in the West, especially the Southwest, have more bee species than all of those Eastern states put together. So as you move from East to West and from North to South, bee species richness increases. The Southwest is the place to be if you're a bee. Uh, Nevada kind of takes the cake with 1,643 bee species so far. Uh, that's more than double all of those eastern states. But then it's also a really big state 
with a really big latitudinal gradient, really big elevational gradient, highest and lowest places, and a lot of really unique habitats with a lot of endemic plants and endemic bees that go along with that. Um, and this pattern of seeing bee species richness at its highest in the deserts, not in the tropics like our birds and our beetles and our butterflies, which are all, you know, reach peak of diversity in, in jungles. Everywhere around the world that you go, the drier and hotter the place, the more likely it is to have really high bee diversity. It's a common pattern that we see. Um, so how do we study these bees? It usually requires taking samples from habitats or landscapes of interest. I think of it as a blood draw. So I get a little sample. I catch some of them from the area. I have to euthanize them and I bring them back to a lab space where I can look at them under a microscope. I have to figure out which each one is, which is difficult or maybe even impossible in the field because the differences are things like how pointy are the parts on the front of the thorax. So if you look at sort of where the shoulders are on that bee, you can see one of them has little points and the other one's a little more rounded. These are things you can't see in the field. So if you want to know how diverse an area is, you really need a sample in order to understand it. So I take a sample from an area and bring them back. I put little a pin through them, which is like a handle so you can hold the bee. And I look under the microscope. <clears throat> and for me, putting bees onto these pins in this way, it kind of creates a little distance between the bee and what it does. Um, it can be hard as I'm trying to identify some particularly challenging group to remember that connection that the bee has with the ecosystem where it occurs and that they're important to a functioning landscape. Even in the field, when you see a bee on a flower, maybe it's easy to just see the bee and a flower rather than thinking about that pollination that's happening there, which is important. Maybe, maybe we think as far as, oh, they pollinate the delicious things that we really like to eat. Um, I like sometimes to show people, I made up this Carol Cafe, my last name's Carol. If I had another life, maybe I would run a diner. And maybe this is some of what I would serve. Um, this is, I, I wish. <laughs> but we could imagine a menu that had a couple appetizers, some salads and soups, a few sandwiches, some entrees and desserts. And we can think about what this might look like without bees to do the pollinating that we need. It's not that, it's not that the foods on here that I'm going to show would completely go away, but they would become so much scarcer. There would be so many fewer that uh, dinner would become very expensive. Making a tasty dinner would be a little more expensive because the, the foods that we like would become much rarer. Uh, for example, artichokes would go away without bees as pollinators every single ingredient in tasty salsa would be gone. I don't know what I do. <laughs> salsa is the best food. Uh, the spicy Italian part of sausage would go away. Kale would go away because you'd eat that. Cucumbers and tomatoes would go away. Your Greek salad would be much, much less than it is now. Most of the things on a BLT that taste really good would go away, but give it that extra flavoring. Green chilies, zucchini, the garlic would go away, green chili rice would go away, eggplant, and of course, all of our fruit pies would go away. So the menu would look something like this instead. I mean, queso is still there. I suppose that's something. We still have olives. Olives are not pollinated at all by bees, so they would remain. That would be okay. But remember, too, that bees pollinate uh, alfalfa. They, they are, we, need, we need bees for alfalfa, and alfalfa is what you feed to dairy cows. So without bees, we wouldn't have dairy, which means that in fact, our cheeses would go away. So our menu would be, I mean, pretty simple <laughs> or super expensive to have something really nice. We rarely consider what a bee does across this huge landscape. We may think about the food and like, it's kind of scary to think about how boring my dinner plate would be without bees. But when you think about it in terms of not just one bee, but all of the bees, bees who are visiting many flowers and all of those multiple interactions that are playing out in synchrony across space and through time, it gets a little more complicated. Uh, I'm gonna demonstrate this by showing you one of the ways that ecologists like to model bee-plant relationships that we see. So along the bottom are five common plants that bloom. They're actually all blooming right now uh, in my front yard. <clears throat> and they are common throughout the desert southwest. And here are four bees that are also common where I live and that are likely to visit these flowers. And we can see through the interactions with the flowers that all of these bees 
can be connected. So let me show you what I mean by that. In the upper left corner is a bee called Melisodes. It's a longhorn bee, like the longhorn cattle with those long antenna. And um, a good majority of them are specialists on things in the Asteraceae, the sunflower family. So we can draw a line between that bee and the flowers that it might visit. The bee next to it is a mason bee. Many of them prefer only penstemons. They specialize on penstemon, and that's the only plant that they'll visit. Bumblebees are different. They're kind of generalists. And they'll visit most anything. And our green metallic sweat bees are also generalists. So what's really interesting is to note that through the connections on the flowers, all of the bees are actually connected to each other. And all of the flowers are also connected to each other. Um, and this is interesting to think about because the implication is, well, what would happen if the penstemon went away? Uh, now the, the, the uh, mason bee has to go away. But more than that, the bumblebee that was visiting that plant is going to have to switch and maybe visit the mint a little more. And when that happens, now competition goes up on that plant um, and really can change sort of how things play out. Um, we could also think about what would happen if we added in some sort of invasive plant, like some of the thistles that I get around here. Uh, if we add this in, it's really fascinating because nine times out of 10, when a plant is added to an ecosystem, it's going to be something invasive that bees really like. I think part of the reason invasive plants are so successful is because bees really like to visit them for, for nectar and also quite a bit for pollen. So they get a lot of good seed set. So if we add in this invasive plant here, we can see what would happen. Many of these bees might switch and start visiting that and maybe not visit the mint anymore. So now we have lower seed set and some things. Um, anyway, removing and adding plants can change the entire network pretty dramatically. So it's important to think about bee plant interactions um, in terms of all of the things that are playing out at once. And I made up this example. This isn't real, but I want to show you one that actually is so you can get a sense um, for how, how this actually happens. So here's a paper. This is a science paper that was published in 2013. It's a really cool idea what they did here. So it's based on a data set from 130 years ago. There was a guy named Charles Robertson. He was an incredible naturalist who lived near like um, sort of south centrally Illinois, a place called Carlinville. And he had some field sites that he would head out to. I like to envision it because he was probably traveling out there on horseback in the 1890s. And he would record by hand meticulously all of the bee and flower interactions that he saw. And of course, we still have those here. Let me show you a picture. This is what he looked like. Um, we still have all of his data. We still have all of this. So we can revisit those same field sites that he went to all of these years later and look to see if the bee plant relationships have changed. So the scientists who did this focused on 26 flowers, um, the best visited ones in the area, and looked to see if the same bees that he caught 120 years ago are still on those plants. So this is an actual plant pollinator network. You can look at this. So over on the left side, these are the 26 plants. The same 26 plants that he looked at were still there. And on the right side are the bees. So the ones in red are bees that he found and the scientists 120 years later did not find. The bees in black were ones that were there when he visited and also are still there. And then the lines in blue represent new interactions. So the bee was there before, the plant was there before, but 120 years ago, a, a, a visit between the bee, a visit of the bee onto that plant hadn't been recorded. So overall, they found 109 bee species, but the linkages have changed over time. The linkages have changed. So the only 24% of those original linkages are still there. Everything's changed a little bit. 407 of 532 interactions from 120 years ago were not found. Not because the plants weren't there, but because the bees weren't there. Now, don't, don't take this too far. Don't read too much into this. I want to walk you through some of the things that might have happened. Number one, think about the fact that I told you invasive plants actually are really popular with bees. So something that happens sometimes is when you add a new plant in, all of the generalists and many of these in red that they didn't find are generalists, will move from the, uh, the plant that they used to be on onto the invasive. And because they didn't sample on it, it could be the bee is still there, it's just visiting a different plant now. But again, the plant pollinator network has changed. 
The other thing that I see when I zoom in on this, and of course I like bees, so I, I look at all the data closely, is that many of these, all of these ones that say nomada here, down here, all these ones that say Cicodes, are a group of bees called kleptoparasites. So this is really interesting. These bees are similar to cuckoo birds, they're cuckoo bees, and what they do is they sneak into the nest of a normal bee and lay an egg when the when the normal mama host bee isn't home they'll lay an egg and sneak back out before she gets home and that egg hatches into a little tiny larva that has these giant scissor-like mouth parts on the front of its body and it chops the other bee that's supposed to be in there in half the larva the baby bee and then eats the pollen that's in there itself so the adults don't collect any pollen to feed their own offspring. They rely on someone else to do the pollen collecting. So they're not specialists. They'll, they visit for nectar now and again, but um, the, the fact that they weren't found again doesn't necessarily mean that they're not there because the bees that host them are still there. It might be that they've just found, you know, dandelion or something to visit instead. Uh, okay, the other thing that we don't really know about this, and I wish we did, but hindsight, right, is um, Robertson's sampling effort. We don't know how much time he put into this, and so we don't know if we should have spent more time out there or something else that might have changed uh, how likely we, we are to find one of these. But there's an example, a plant pollinator network and how we can use that data to understand ecological relationships in a community. Um, here's another, and this is one I know quite well because this was my master's. So uh, for my master's project, I studied a national monument that occurs in south central Utah called Grand Staircase Escalani National Monument. And at the time that I did this, it was a brand new national monument just created, uh, really intensely focused on doing scientific research. And they were interested in creating a list of all the bees that occurred in this huge monument of like two million acres. So we set up these plots that we sampled every other week for the duration of a six month flowering season. And you can see those plots just plotted on the map of the monument here as yellow squares. And then we also opportunistically collected throughout wherever we could. And over the course of four years of doing this, so four years of sampling the same plots over and over again, uh, we collected something like uh, 80,000 individual bees. Sounds like a lot, Again, it's just a sample. If you do the math, it works out to something like one bee per four years per four acres. So one bee collected in a four acre spot every four years. So 80,000 sounds like a lot. It's not really on something that big. Uh, we spent a total of 1,600 days collecting in the area. And um, our, our, our uh, plots ended up being pretty representative of the bee population of a whole. We ended up with almost 75% of all of the 660 bee species that we found in the area being collected in those plots. Um, and because we sampled in this really, you know, standardized, very strategic way, every time we visited one of those plots, we collected it in the same way, we built this really cool data set where we can compare things over time and see how it changes, which is really neat. So let me show you the plant pollinator networks that I built from doing this. So here's one plot, just one of those squares in one year, just one year. Uh, the yellow circles are all bees and the blue circles are flowers. Uh, and it represents all interactions over the course of the year. So all of those gray lines represent an, a, a bee plant visit. And um, one of the things I love about this is that it when you view it like this, it, inter, uh, it sort of emphasizes the interaction instead of the name of the bee and the plant. What you're focused on is the interaction between the two. I thought it might be interesting. Maybe if we concatenate the bee and the plant name together and start referring to them as one entity, it might help us think about um, sort of what's happening on the landscape a little differently. But because I sampled every two weeks, I can also divide this up according to different months. So this is what happens in May. You can see that in May, um, milk fetch, your local weed, vetch, something like that. Uh, Astragalus is the genus. It's something that blooms kind of early in the year along with a couple asters. And um, we got several bees that come out really early in the season were on those. By June, things really pick up. We end up with one invasive species that you guys probably know, tamarisk, and also with uh, milkweed. Milkweed comes in and some bees get it. 
in July, it's really hot, not much is happening. Most of the plants die. We don't really get any new bee interactions, um, kind of a lull. But by August, things pick up again. Following monsoons, the bees are out again. Some interesting plants and fall blooming things come. And then in September, we get sort of a wrap up of the season with a few last little bees hanging on. Notice that through the interactions of a few things that bloom or fly for a long period, much of the network ends up connected kind of through these hubs with a few things a little more isolated. Um, you can think of the hubs as, anyone know the Kevin Bacon game where you try and find the connections? I think there are a few plants that are similar to Kevin Bacon and that everybody can be connected to them if you just do a couple hops. Um, just a few degrees of, of separation, I think is how they say it. So these beautiful webs can make it seem like bees and plants have worked out perfectly how to share the commodity that is pollen, right? So the bee collects pollen, the plant uses the pollen too, and they seem to have it perfectly worked out. I would say that in fact, the incredible variation in, in floral form and in color and scent and the size of the flowers we see around the world is really the result of this constant interaction, almost like a battle between bees and flowers. I would say that the appearance and the life histories of both bees and plants is driven in large part by their reliance on each other and also their need to make the other partner do what they want. Um, <clears throat> they both need each other and you'd almost say there's sort of a bit of a love-hate relationship going on here. So think about this for a minute. Every grain of pollen that a bee harvests and takes back to a nest somewhere to provide for its own offspring is success from the point of view of a bee. That's fitness, but it's also the opposite for the plant. That is, that is exactly not what the plant wants to happen. So every successful bee offspring comes at the expense of a potential plant seed and vice versa. If the pollen makes it onto it, the stigma of another flower somewhere, something like that, that's a bee that wasn't made. A little bee offspring wasn't provided for. So the appearance is driven also by their need to sort of manipulate each other. And I'm this has been talked about for a very long time. Um, lots of people have talked about this. Charles Darwin has quotes about it in his book. Um, I think my favorite way of wording it, there's a guy named Paul Westerkamp who kind of has been studying pollination for a really long time. And he described it as a balanced mutual exploitation. And I think that kind of sums it up. And I just want to end by showing you a few examples because I think it's really neat to, to rethink the relationship between bees and plants it is perfect in that it provides fruits for us, and that's why we think of bees in this way and plants in this way. But on the other hand, it's also the result of this, this push-pull um, tug that's happening between them. So as an example, this here is a, a lovely bee that's visiting a manzanita flower. You guys have these in the higher elevations in Nevada, Nevada and maybe you've seen them there. And they can't fit inside the flowers of the Arctostaphylus, the manzanita flowers. And so instead they chew a hole at the base and steal the nectar out so they get that sweet treat without having to cram their bodies inside these tight little flowers. And what's interesting is when they do that, they actually make that flower less attractive for future bees that could potentially um, pollinate it. And so it's it's good for the bee, but detrimental for the flower. Here's another example. This is the Rocky Mountain bee plant. And you can see over on the left side, there's a little tiny small perdita over there, one of those fairy bees. And it's taking pollen off, but it's not going to touch the stigma ever. So it's stealing pollen, but contributing nothing in return. Meanwhile, on the other side, that honeybee, the, the, the chicken, the chicken of the bee world, uh, is probably doing a much better job of getting pollen moved around. Uh, moving outside the country just for fun, this one's really cool. This is an orchid found in sort of Mediterranean climates. It's called Ophrys apifera. Apifera is apis, right? Similar. Uh, it's a really incredible flower. Um, it's got a pretty distinctive appearance for an orchid. Uh, it's able to grow in really terrible soils because it has these cool relationships with mycorrhizal fungi that help it survive and thrive. And it blooms in late spring when bees are out and apparently it looks like an attractive female bee. Uh, from this angle, maybe it's a little more obvious. You can see like, you know, a little abdomen here, some back legs sticking out, some antenna, something like that. 
Anyway, in the north part of its range, it self-pollinates, but down south, there's a bee called Eucera longicornis. I'll show you a picture here in a minute. And the males are often seen visiting and in fact, trying to mate with these flowers. And it turns out that the plant even produces um, floral scent molecules, so volatile compounds that mimic the scent of the female bee. And in the process of visiting pollinia, the, the, um, the, the pollen on an orchid gets stuck to the thorax, and the bee fails, it didn't, uh, wasn't successful in its attempt to mate and it leaves in frustration, regains composure and then goes and tries again. Uh, thus pollinating the flower, but not really getting any compensation for its hard work. This one here is a bee that we find in uh, South Africa. It's pretty neat. It's a really interesting relationship. This bee has these incredibly long forelegs that it uses to reach deep inside of a flower's corolla to extract floral oils that it then uses to feed its offspring. So it uses plant oils instead of just pollen and nectar to feed its offspring. And this is the plant. So you can see these really long um, spurs on this thing that have the oils in it. Presumably it elongated in order to draw the bees in close to the stigma and anthers. So as the, the spurs get longer, the bee has to lean in more. So it's manipulating the bee a little bit. Uh, and the bee leg, what they found that's really neat is different populations of this plant where they occur, the length of the bee's legs in these different areas exactly matches the length of the corolla spurs where they are. So some are short, some are long, but wherever they are, they match the bees in that area. We don't have to go all the way to Africa, of course, to find interesting things like that. This is a wool carter bee. They're actually really common in Nevada. One of the um, highest abundances or uh, richnesses of this bee is in Nevada. And they visit plants that have pollen um, kind of on the top part of the flower. And they have these corkscrew shaped hairs on their face, sort of right in this region here. And when they stick their head in and stick their tongue out to get um, nectar out of the plant, all of those hairs end up touching all of the pollen parts on the plant and pulling pollen off of it. Really neat adaptation. And finally, last one I'll show you, I think. Uh, this is another plant uh, solution. And this is this is pretty smart. So if you ever look at a, a sunflower, you'll notice that you know inside that disc-shaped part there where all of the little yellow bits of pollen are, you can see that they're in concentric rings and that not all of the pollen is available at the same time. And that's because of bees like this. This is a dianomia. It's a specialist on sunflowers. They're really, really beautiful and intricate bees, but they specialize on just sunflowers. And it's thought to be able to provision three or four offspring from the pollen of just one flower off of a, a sunflower. And so if it were to scrape all of the pollen off of there and provide for those offspring, the plant would have failed completely at being a flower. <laughs> uh, but what's really neat is the pollen, because it's released slowly over the course of, you know, a week, um, the bee is forced to visit multiple flowers in a day in order to provide quickly. So it has to move from flower to flower, thus ensuring that the plant gets pollinated, which is pretty neat. Um, I should tell you now, there's really no reason for you to know any of this. <laughs> uh, it probably won't change your life in any big way. The bees and the plants will continue to battle for control in their relationships, regardless of whether we understand and know what's going on. But I like to think of bees as, as a gateway bug. Each of these bee species has a really cool story to tell. And you can think of the flowers as sort of supporting characters in this intricate, story that's been playing out on our landscapes for over 60 million years. And I'm hoping that knowing these stories will help you appreciate and better celebrate the incredible beauty that comes from these complicated interactions and maybe consider the possibility that other interactions are playing out all around us all the time and that maybe you can go look in your own backyards, go look on your own hikes, go look in gold buttes and find some of these things happening there just because it's so fun to know about. Uh, I'm going to stop there. I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Uh, I think I will, there, okay. Should I keep sharing my screen? Should I stop? I'm not sure. You can stop okay. um, and then it'll just show your face. And we do have one chat question. 
says, I have read recently that bumblebee populations are dropping dramatically. Is there a reason why this particular group is in jeopardy? That's a great question. Um, yeah, so in North America, there's somewhere around, I think, 50 bee, uh, bumblebee species. And um, of those, they're, they're fairly easy to study relative to other bees because they, they grow to kind of a large colony size each year. And so we can get a good enough sample to really see when ranges shift or when the population starts to fall. And several studies have looked at this throughout North America and have found four of those bumblebees in particular that have decline dramatically. Two of them are western species and two of them are eastern species. Interestingly, three of them are all in the same subgenus and there's some thought that there's something about that particular genetic clade makes them more susceptible to some of the things that bumblebees are facing now, which includes climate change. Bumblebees are kind of a holdover, sort of a relic from a much colder time period, the last glacial ice ages, stuff like that. Um, and so maybe they're more susceptible to that. But two, we're seeing that bumblebees are susceptible to some viruses that have come over with uh, invasive, not invasive, non-native bumblebees from Europe and from Asia that have particular pathogens that our native bumblebees are not well adapted to um, fight off. So we don't know for sure, but the, some of the thoughts are that it has to do with either the pathogen or um, something about their genetic makes, makeup makes them susceptible to the changing climate. At the same time, just for interest sake, just so you know, there's actually several species of bumblebee and we don't talk about them because they're not declining. They're actually becoming more abundant. So there's several that seem to become, be, seem to be having their day in the sun. They're really um, exploding in terms of where they're found, like, and how many, how abundant they are when we do find them. But yeah, uh, bumblebees are the ones we best know about population declines in. We have another question. Do all bees sting? Another great question. You guys, these are great. Uh, potentially. So the, the sting is a modified ovipositor. So ovipositor means egg layer. So all bees possess, all female bees, all female bees lay eggs. And so they all possess an ovipositor. They all possess a sting. So potentially any female bee could sting you and male bees can't. They literally cannot. They don't possess a sting. So 50% of the time you're safe. Uh, that being said, it's actually even less than 50% because there are several bees that are either so small or not adapted to fending off humans. You know, they're, they're fighting off other horrible predators instead, they can't penetrate human skin. So there's several groups that even if they wanted to sting you, they wouldn't be able to. But potentially all female bees have a sting and should be able to sting something. <laughs> um, one comment, Olivia, what a great presentation. Thank you. And I would echo that myself. This has been awesome. Um, but we do have more questions. One is, what is the best way to bee watch? Just park yourself in front of a flower and watch? Are yes. there particular times of day where they're more active? These are great. I love all of these. Um, yeah, particular times of day. So I find that different bees fly at different times of day. So depending on when you're out, we'll just change what you get to see. Um, Any time between, well, you guys are at like a hundred and something odd degrees right now. So that opens the window up pretty wide. Where you are, I would say anywhere from 8 a.m. to 11 is probably really good. And the reason for that is all of the flowers had overnight to recover the nectar that they lost to bees during the day. And so all of the flowers are replenished and the bees are madly collecting all of the nectar and pollen before anyone else gets to it. By early afternoon, because of evaporation, because it's so hot and because all of the bee visits, flowers can sometimes kind of shut down and they don't do as much. And then the bees go home and work on nest maintenance and all of that stuff. And then they may there may be another slight peak, sort of three to five-ish, depending on the temperature, where you can see them again. My favorite way to watch bees is to find a plant that I know they like. Maybe I bring with me a cold drink or maybe I bring my coffee, depending on the time, time of day, and just stand there and watch. And you'll start to see them. I think the hardest part is that most people don't recognize that they're looking at a bee when they see it. It'll be right in front of them. They just don't know that bees don't look like honeybees, you know? And so once you overcome that and started really looking and paying attention, um, 
you'll find that they're on most plants. Uh, where I am, really good, easy ones are sunflowers because they're big, open, disc-shaped flowers, so the bees can't hide. They're they're out there on the stage for you to see. Um, you know, penstemons and some of these flowers where the bee kind of goes inside a corolla, they're harder to see because they're hiding in there. Um, but find some sunflowers, some other big, open plant. Watch it for a little bit. They fly fast in flight. You won't be able to see them, but when they land and start rooting around, especially early in the morning, you should get a good look. Okay, next question, uh, Olivia, very interesting presentation. How many times have you been stung? Oh, more than I can count. Uh, I haven't been stung this year, I don't think. Huh, watch, I'll get stung tomorrow. I, um, a couple times a year, probably. I don't know, two or three times a year. The thing is like a honeybee sting is the most painful of all of them because they leave their stinger behind and it continues to pulse venom into your body. Um, wild bee venom is not very potent and they don't leave their sting behind because if they did and they died, like that's the end of their entire lineage, which isn't true for honeybees because they're not at home making babies. Someone else does that. So um, they just poke, it's a quick poke. And then it'll kind of itch like a mosquito bite for maybe like three minutes long enough to make you, you know, notice. And then, and then it's over and it's done and it's not a big deal at all. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't squeeze a carpenter bee or a bumblebee. Those ones are a little more painful, but the rest, it's really hardly worth even, I don't tell anyone when I get stung because it's not a big deal. We have another question. What accounts for the relationship between arid environments and bee abundance? Yeah, Jim, that's a great question. And we don't know fully. And part of the problem is that we can't do any sorts of experiments where we would do a control and a test to see if we could increase bee richness. It's, uh, it'd be, you know, an earth level experiment to pull that off. Um, so some of our best guesses are, um, well, I'll start with the easy ones. So the flowering season in many arid environments tends to be much longer. So, you know, where I live, things bloom from March all the way through, you know, September, October. So you have this really long window, but no plant blooms continuously throughout that. So we have in March, we have the astragalus blooming. And then in you know, April, we have a different set. And so we end up with all these little niches and each one has specialists and generalist bees visiting it. So it's uh, arid environments tend to support a bigger diversity of bees that utilize all of these little niches that have been created. So that's one possibility. Two, that longer flowering season just means there's more time for different bees to be out. Um, and then, even, I, I don't know, it, apparently, and I've never been to the rainforest, so I can't say for sure, but a lot of times you get things like orchids and whatever that bloom, and they bloom, the same plant blooms for many months before it quits. So that might be part of it. My favorite hypothesis, again, hypothesis, is that because deserts tend to be these unpredictable environments where one year you'll have a super bloom, and you'll have carpets of flowers that spread forever. And then the next year it's a drought and all of the flowers end up in pockets because bees have such a short uh, life cycle. When they're isolated, there's a chance for speciation to occur quickly around these pockets of flowers. And then when they come back together, you know, enough uh, genetic uh, divergences happen that you end up with two species where once you had one. So I think that unpredictable sort of um, boom or bust nature of deserts around the world that happens everywhere tends to um, promote higher rates of speciation. Okay, um, next question. Are yellow jackets considered a bee or a wasp? Yellow jackets are considered a wasp. And so the way you tell the difference is by their diet. Um, except for some real weirdo bees that occur in South America. All bees eat pollen and nectar and all wasps, except for one weirdo that lives here in North America, eat, eat meat. So wasps are meat eaters, bees are flower eaters. Um, technically on the tree of life, looking at all of the, where's my hand? Here's a hand. All of the branches on the tree, um, wasps make up the trunk and there's all these different uh, branches that are different groups of wasps and one of those branches is the bees. So bees are the group of wasps that switch diets to be pollen eaters instead. 
wasps. So they're technically wasps. Uh, yellow jackets, though, are predators, and they are most definitely wasps. Um, how do we know a native bee when we see one? Um, I would say, in general, so in North America, there are 60 non-native bee species out of the almost 4,000 that we have here. Um, by and large, chances are good that if it's not a honeybee, it's a native bee. Um, I think you're you're pretty pretty safe guessing it is. There's a few um, non-native bees in urban environments that are becoming common enough that we can pick them out and, and know that they're not. But but most of them we wouldn't know. So there's two species of Osmia that have horns on their head that stick out like this, like literal horns. Um, and they're both from, from Japan, from Asia. And so those might be ones that you would see that you would know it's not a native. And then there's a European wool carter bee, which is this really big yellow and black bee that likes to hover around sage, especially if you have any sage in your yard and you see that. That's probably a non-native. All the rest that you're probably going to see are native bees. Um, next comment. This is fascinating, Olivia. Thank you very much. What is the status of those so-called killer Africanized bees? Yeah, so um, the they're mostly they're mostly not the problem they were twenty years ago. Um, so one of the interesting things that's, that's happened is the Africanized bee was never a separate species. It was just a it was a subspecies. It was a race of a, a, a hybrid of a couple different, it's a mutt, right? Like it was a mutt, like our dogs, um, that was a cross between two subspecies of honeybee that we thought might create this super efficient bee and it backfired. And they started in South America and then made their way north. And as they did, they have slowly interbred with more docile, more domesticated, more easygoing honeybees as they've gone. And so we're seeing a dilution of that aggressive killer effect in them. There are still isolated incidences that are really sad and terrible, and, and there's still a problem in some places, but they're less common than they used to be as it becomes diluted. Also, if you live in an area that freezes in the winter, they're aggressive with each other too. So they don't huddle as tightly together as a lot of our other honeybee subspecies do. And so they don't fare well in um, colder environments and they have to recolonize those areas every year. So um, I know that's not the case where you guys live, but kind of north of where you are, you know, another couple hundred miles, they, they, they can't exist. They won't be there. They may exist in the summer and then they go away again, but they're not year round residents. Okay, the next question, I'll read it, but it, you probably addressed it. Is hybridization of honeybees still a concern, the so-called Africanized or killer bees? Uh, uh, Jim Lane, let me know if I didn't answer that. I think I might have maybe gotten yeah. that. Okay. I just wanted to make sure I got everyone's question. And then another, you said people don't recognize bees. So how do we know by looking that it's a bee rather than a wasp or a fly or something else? Man, I wonder if I have a picture I could pull up to show you. Um, it's it's It takes a little practice, but once you've practiced, it's really not too bad. So flies and bees are pretty easy to tell apart because um, they have so many differences just because of the differences in their life history. Typically, bees tend to be fuzzier. As they fly through the air, their hair actually develops an electrostatic charge. And then when they land on the plant, it has the opposite charge and the pollen is literally pulled towards their body by the fact that they flew through the air and got all staticky. Uh, so that the, the hair is one of the things, especially hair on the back legs or on the underside of the abdomen where they, they hold on to pollen and sort of giant insect grocery bags, if you will. Uh, bees also smell flowers using their antenna. And so to find the flowers, they need really long antenna. It's equivalent to like a big nose or something, maybe on a hound dog. And so um, they tend to have really big antenna, whereas flies tend to have short little antenna just right at the tip of their face. And then bees have a forehead. They have really widely spaced eyes set far apart, whereas fly eyes tend to come together and almost top, touch on the top of the head. And they tend to have spindlier legs, whereas bees have um, furrier, more fuzzy legs. So flies and bees are pretty easy. Flies are in the order Diptera, which means they have 
a total of two wings. You can think of it like this. There's the two, right? One, two wings, one on either side. Whereas bees have four wings. So they have two on either side of the body. And when the um, when they land just right, sometimes you can make out the two versus the four wings. Uh, wasps and bees are a little trickier because technically the bee is a wasp. So they share a lot of characteristics in common, but their different life histories have led to some differences there as well. Wasps tend to, look, they're predators, right? They're hunting grasshoppers or spiders or caterpillars or whatever it is they're hunting. And so they tend to have long, spindly, spiny legs that they can use to wrap around and hang on to their prey to call it back to the nest to feed to their offspring. They tend to have pointier little mouth parts that they use um, to, to sort of bite onto something. And they tend to be long and scrawny. In my mind, they look a little like an Olympic swimmer, right? So they have no hair on their body. They tend to have these really long gangly legs and they tend to have a really narrow waist. So if you see those features, it's more likely to be a wasp than a bee. Bees, again, are short, compact, burly little things with lots of, but they're flying teddy bears. It's like a flying teddy bear. Um, what's, oh, and then bees, some wasps, a fair number of them have silvery hairs, sort of like mirror glistening hairs on their faces, and uh, bees never have that. So if you see that glint in the sun, it's definitely a wasp. That was a lot. If you look, uh, go to um, beesinyourbackyard.com. You can find a couple pictures that will show you how to tell the two apart. That might help too. Hey, Jim Lane says, yes, you did answer his question, but what about the bee fly? They really look like bees. They do really look like bees, but if you look, the bee fly does not have antenna. They're really short little antenna right here, whereas bees have these long antenna. Uh, even the bee fly, it's almost <laughs> the same, but not quite. Then uh, what value do wasps, wasps bring to the party? So my IPM friends, insect pest management, integrated, integrated pest management, uh, they think wasps are great because wasps tend to get rid of a lot of the things that we think of as pests in our gardens, for example. Um, all of those horrible, what are they, hornworm, hornworm caterpillars? Did I get the name right? They eat your tomatoes, drive mm -hmm. me crazy. Uh, wasps will eat them. Wasps will take care of those things. So they're predators that clean up a lot of the stuff that we don't like around and, you know, I started this by talking about interactions, and I really think interactions are an important thing to remember because the bee or the wasp caterpillar, the wasp prey interaction is part of balancing out this whole system. And you tweak one little piece, uh, it, it changes all of it. The reverberations are felt throughout. So by being predators, um, they're probably up there on that keystone species sort of list by keeping everything in check. Do they call it top-down, top-down predation? All right, that appears to be all of the chat questions. Would anyone like to unmute themselves and ask a verbal question? Because now is the time. Oh, another question. Does the tarantula hawk wasp always succeed with the tarantula victim? I don't know. I, my, my first guess would be no, probably not. Nobody's ever successful all the time. Uh, but I don't know for sure. That's just my my guess without any experience. I love watching. It's so cool, but I, I guess I've only ever seen the successes. Uh, probably not. Probably they fail sometimes. Any more chat questions, guys? Any verbal questions? Bravo. <laughs> well, Olivia, if there are no more questions and there might be one or two trickling in, but I would certainly like to thank you for coming on tonight and sharing your knowledge with us. This has been amazing. And I learned a ton of, of stuff about bees tonight. This has been it's, really great. It's been an absolute pleasure talking about this with all of you. It's great. Thank you for the invitation. You bet. Great info, great presentation, including the data visualization. Thanks for spending time with us. Love your energy. Oh, yes, of course. You, do. <laughs> you can tell you really like your subject matter. This is great. It's hard not to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, I think I'm going to shut it down. If everybody's done, Olivia, once again, thank you so much. And I look forward to anything else you'd have to present in the future. If you'd ever like to come thank back, you, we'd love to have you.
Thank you, you very much. Take All care. Right. Good night. You, you too. Good night. Bye.